Good morning, everyone. I hope you and your family are well and are prepared for anything that's coming along with Hurricane Laura this evening. We're glad you came today for this diversion. And speaking of diversion, today we're going to discuss waste diversion. I'm Andrea Tantillo, and on behalf of our staff and presenters, I want to tell you we all appreciate your attendance today and welcome your questions during the Q&A portion of the event and your feedback through the survey link that I'll send after the webinar. There's a few housekeeping things I wanna let you know about. First, this meeting is being recorded. All microphones for people who aren't presenting today will be muted throughout the presentations. And if you're on your phone and unmuted, please take this moment to mute your phone. We will have a question and answer period for our presenters after all the presenters have finished. So please hold your questions for the end. But if you have a question for HGAC staff during the presentation or just want to get your question to the presenters at the top of the list, please type your question in the chat box. And if your question is for a specific speaker, include their name in your question so we'll know who to address it to. And if your questions are about the meeting platform or some other topic that HGAC staff can help you with, please enter them in our chat and one of our moderators, that's me, Wendy Amundson or Erin Livingston, will work to get you some answers. There's an agenda in the download in the hand, handout sections that you can download today and you can print it off and see more information about our speakers. And I also wanna let you know real quick that we had a fifth speaker today and it was Sabrina England, but she was unable to make it because she's the public works director for the city of Lake Jackson and she was gonna talk about their composting program. However, she is in emergency management meetings this morning and won't be able to join us. Now with that out of the way, I wanna take a quick look at the agenda. So you may be asking yourself, what do uniform recycling, community compost programs, food bank programming and construction materials reuse have in common? Well, at first glance, maybe not a lot, but all these topics represent potential waste that could end up in the landfill if not diverted, reclaimed, or reused. And today we have some great speakers and presentations lined up for you. Colleen Halbrook with Josco Products will discuss textile recycling, recovery, destruction, and transformation. Jeff Payne with Break It Down will talk about composting in your community. John Crager with Montgomery County Food Bank will present Food Banks, part of the Zero Waste Solution. And Keith Kosky with the City of Houston Building Materials Reuse Warehouse will wrap up with a discussion on the Building Materials Reuse Warehouse after 10 years, challenges, successes, and the unexpected. We'll conclude this webinar with questions and answers and announcements from staff. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Colleen Halbrook owner of Josco Products. Hello, all right, how do, okay, share my screen. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me, Andrea, to talk about my passion for textile recycling. Um, we're a family-owned business that started in November of 1980. So we are getting close to celebrating 40 years in business. But we didn't start off in textile recycling. We started off by selling fiberglass raw materials for the six boat builders that were in Austin. And um, one of the items that we sold to them was polishing cloths for polishing the molds of the boats. Um, and about in 1987, for those of us who are old enough to remember that, that was a pretty big recession that hit Texas and the wiping rag business um, sort of became the, to the forefront of our business because the six boat builders that were in Austin left Austin, some went out of business, some moved, and we started selling wiping rags. Um, we bought a company that had, was going out of business and that's how we got started, but my passion for recycling goes back to when I was a young girl, like in the third grade, which is a long time ago, when you could turn your Coke bottles back in and get a couple pennies, maybe a dime back, and you could actually take an aluminum can to a recycling center and get money. And I remember my parents and I bringing our old newspapers to the local recycling 
um, Center in Wayne, Illinois. So it's always been a big deal to me. Now I can figure out how to move the next slide. There we go. There we go. So textile recycling, this is a picture of our warehouse. It is the oldest form of recycling. It is documented by the ancient Egyptians when they were taking their clothes and making rags out of it. And in North America, most of the textile recycling that got started was started by Eastern European immigrants who came over and couldn't find jobs. And they started out as rag and bone men. And they went around collecting clothes and discarded textiles from trash bins, turning them into wiping rags, selling them back to the housewives and industry for rags. So textile recovery has you know, been around forever, it seems like. So the question is, where do you fit in? E each of us personally, where do we fit in? And where does Josco products fit in? So some of you may or, not, may or not be aware that there are brands that encourage consumers to return their items back to them when they buy a new item. And then those items are either um, recycled and or repaired and resold to somebody else. So like H&M, Zara, Patagonia and North Face are sort of at the leading edge of that aspect. So Josco Products, our family business, is a member of SMART, and SMART stands for Secondary Material and Recycled Textiles. It's a trade association that's been around since 1932. There's a, three different types of memberships. One is what we call the graders, or who export and um, sort used clothing. Then there's the wiping rag manufacturers like my company, Josco Products. And then there's the fiber converters. Um, the used clothing makes up the majority of the membership and then fiber conversion makes the least. And so wiping rags is sort of in the middle. And the membership globally, it's 60% North America. So that's primarily Canada and the United States. Then there's um, we've got members in uh, India, Pakistan, UAE, Central and South America, and Europe. So it's a global issue, and the reason it's a global issue is because there's clothes everywhere. So thinking about this, what do Walmart, Target, Forever 21, H&M, and other retailers contribute to this global issue, and how does social media impact the buying decisions of consumers. So thinking about that, I mean, you, you go to the mall, maybe not these days, but in the past or online shopping, I mean, people are just buying lots and lots of clothing. So where do these used and unwanted textiles go? Because closets can only hold so much. And uh, the bigger question is textile recycling, is it increasing or decreasing? why and what is the percentage of change. So the leading cause of the global rise of textile recycling and the amount of unwanted clothing is what we call fast fashion. And I put the Wikipedia definition up there and it really is about people being able to buy what is in fashion right now, um, trying to get what is shown on the catwalk into the hands of the consumer who sees it on Instagram or Pinterest or Facebook or someplace else and to get it as quickly as possible. Well, to get it quickly as possible, sometimes that just means that the quality isn't that good. Also, if we're getting, trying to people, trying, if people are trying to get the most fashionable things, it's also turning over really quickly. What they also mean by fast fashion is it, is it changes so fast these days. What used to be in style for a couple years is now in style for a couple months, sometimes only a couple weeks. So typically a fast fashion garment is worn a few times before it falls apart in the washing machine or the owner decides they want to replace it with something new. So it's incredible that we consume a staggering 80 billion, that's not million, that's billion pieces of clothing each year. And this is up 400% from two decades ago. I mean, it used to be that you change your wardrobe in summer and winter. And now I think people are changing their wardrobes on average 
maybe six to eight times a year, some people 12 times a year. So where does what happens to all this unwanted clothing? Because there's so much of it. So this is another picture of our warehouse and kind of at the this part of the screen right here, these are scraps from a company that's here in Austin that takes old t-shirts from like, um, like if you, if you collected all your race t-shirts from your 5Ks and marathons and things like that, they will make a quilt out of your t-shirts and then back it with fleece, which you can kind of see back up here. So they take the middle of the t-shirt and that's left is like the back and the bottom of the t-shirt. And then we cut off the small parts and are able to use the bigger parts to, to sell as wiping rags. So these actually get reused and then recycled. So to me, this is like a great partnership that we have with this company here in Austin. So um, Elizabeth Klein, who wrote The Conscious Closet, the guide to looking good while doing good, states that there's one garbage truck per every two minutes of clothing dumped in the United States. I mean, to me, that is just a phenomenal amount of waste that is just going into the landfill before stuff has reached the, its end of life. So there's good news and there's bad news. I mean, the good news is 95% of materials can be reused or recycled if they're clean, dry, free of hazardous chemicals and solvents, and additionally, no pet hair. Nobody wants to use a rag that smells like somebody's old dog or has got you know pet hair all over it because they don't need that to get left in whatever they're cleaning up or wiping down. In the United States, five to six percent of all landfill is textiles, and only 15 percent of the textiles that are currently being recycled actually get recycled. Um, very few jurisdictions mandate that textiles be recycled, and only a few offer curbside pickup. In Austin, for a while, we had um, simple recycling that came by and picked stuff up, but that didn't work really well in Austin. And um, I think Goodwill is going to be picking things up. If you give them a call, they'll come by your house and, and, and they'll have like a route to pick things up um, for small hard goods and durable goods and soft goods like clothing. But 85% of all clothing is thrown away. So why do people throw things away? Well, they think that it's not good enough to go to a, a thrift store or a charity. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're, um, Perhaps they don't know that it can be recycled. They don't think about, because most people don't think about textiles as recycling. They think about plastics and newspapers and aluminum cans and glass. So if we're throwing away 85% of our clothing, the current estimate is that there's 80 pounds per person per year. Okay, I'm not one of those 80 people, I'm not one of those people that throws away 80 pounds because Obviously, my stuff either goes to a, a charity or it comes here to get um, recycled. And I don't let my husband throw anything away either. In fact, I have recycled some of his T-shirts that had so many holes that I was surprised that it was still held together. Um, but according to the EPA, textile waste is the fastest growing material category in the entire waste stream. Textiles have increased by almost 80% since 2000 whereas the whole waste stream only grew by 10%. Plastics is only up 38%. So, I mean, if, if we think about it, we're, we're losing ground on textile recycling. So I'd like, to, and my hope is, is that after this, we can start to change that. So one of the stories that I like to tell is of a t-shirt, and I'm really sorry that there's not little lines to go between, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. So well, I'll just sort of walk you through it. So. The t-shirt story goes like this. You clean out your closet because you, you need to make room for new stuff or you've decided you're gonna do the Marie Kondo and only keep what gives you joy. So you clean out your closet and you donate what you don't want. And I'm gonna encourage you to donate it all. So you donate it to Goodwill, Salvation Army, Arms of Hope. You stick it in a bin in one of the many parking lots that are around. Austin or Houston or Galveston or wherever you are, the store will figure out what they can sell. 
Now, not all of it gets sold in the store, probably about a third to half actually gets sold in the stores. So what happens to what doesn't get sold in the store? So if something's in really great shape, it will go to a grader and then a grader, if it doesn't sell in the store and it goes to the grader and it's in good shape, the grader will probably export it to a developing country. And so if you've ever watched Discovery Channel and you've seen a young boy in like Kenya wearing a Disney World t-shirt, the likelihood he went to Disney World is probably pretty small, but the likelihood that his mom bought him a Disney World t-shirt that was used is probably pretty big. Now, if we think about that same Disney World t-shirt that your kid loved, wore it all the time, and the reason that it's now being donated is he or she has outgrown it, and there's been a chocolate ice cream stain on there, but your kid didn't care because he loved that t-shirt. Well, the stained t-shirt gets to the grader and the grader's like, oh, well, I can't sell this in an export market, but I can sell it to a wiping rag company like Josco Products. So the grader sells it to us. We take that t-shirt, we cut it up into usable size pieces, take out any part that's too rough that it would like scratch something, and we make it into a rag. We put it in a box, we sell it to the paint store, the paint store sells it to the painter, the painter comes and paints your bathroom and cleans up his mess with your old t-shirt. Now, if you think about this, you got a donation, you got a tax credit when you cleaned out your closet, when you donated it. The store made money either from selling the t-shirt or if they had to sell it to the grader, the grader made money when they sold it to us. We made money when we sold it to the paint store. The paint store made money when they sold it to the painter. The painter made money when they charged you for painting your bathroom. That means that that t-shirt that could have just gone directly to the landfill went through the economy seven times. The, I learned in a marketing class a bajillion years ago in college that the more times something goes through the economy, the bigger impact it has. So this has gone through, this t-shirt generated revenue seven times before it actually goes to the landfill when it's at end of life. So this to me is really important, not only from an, an environmental standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. So besides closet cleanouts, where does Josco products get material? So we, we buy from hotels, um, but that's not happening so much lately because people aren't traveling as much, either for business and or pleasure. We get from linen rental companies. They supply a lot of restaurants and bars for like the towels that they use for wiping down the bar or renting them napkins and things. Um, that's not happening as much. And so kind of a side note on linen rental, one of the rags when we first got into business that was really awesome were white cotton napkins and tablecloths. Unfortunately, that product has gone away. Part of the reason being is, is that cotton tablecloths and napkins don't hold up in the washing machine. They were stained easily. The replacements are 100% polyester. They last 50 laundries versus 10. And um, I don't know about you, but it, you look at economics, if I can get something to rent out 50 times versus 10 times, and it costs the same amount, I'm gonna go for the thing that goes for 50 times. Whether or not it does as good a job wiping up because it really is just to keep the crumbs off your lap when you're eating or to wipe the barbecue stain off your mouth. Um, we also get from thrift stores. There are some thrift stores that don't want to sell to graders because they don't want to export to developing countries. They want it to stay local as much as possible. So we help them out by doing that and keeping it out of the landfill for them. We sell or we, we pick up from hospitals and that's a pretty good flow these days. Summer is always tougher because most people aren't having elective surgeries in the summer because nobody really wants to go get their, you know, bunion taken care of in the summer when they want to be able to go swimming. Um, also right now the hospitals are pretty much trying to do as few elective surgeries as possible and keep as many healthy people out of hospitals as possible during the COVID season. Um, so there's not as many surgeries going on. So we're not seeing as much product coming out of hospitals as we've seen in the past. Textile manufacturers that want to avoid landfilling their scraps. Um, 
there's not as much textile manufacturing happening in the United States as there used to be. Most of it's been offshore to China, but there's still some, like the company I was talking about that, that does the t-shirt quilts. And then one of the things that we do is we offer destruction services. And what I mean by this is we take things that companies and municipalities do not want somebody else wearing or getting use out of. So we take the t-shirts and the uniforms from APD and Austin Fire Department and we cut them up. So we get like lovely 100% cotton t-shirts from Austin Fire and EMS. We love getting those and cutting those up. But we also get things 100% polyester that don't make good rags, but we still go ahead and cut it up so that it ends up unusable by anybody else. It, it still goes to the landfill sometimes, but nobody's gonna be walking around pretending to be a police officer or a fire, fireman when they're really not. We also offer this to corporations and nonprofits that don't want somebody wearing something that they don't want to, they don't want out in the market. We do this for a national brand that's based here in Austin. We have cut up three truckloads, I repeat, three truckloads of t-shirts that they did not want, that were like out of season and they didn't want to get in the landfill nor be sold on the black market, nor did they want to have the bad press that Burberry got a few years ago by burning everything. And we're also right now cutting up a bunch of race shirts for a race that didn't happen. We picked up from a university all of the shirts that they had made for championships that they didn't win because nobody wants to shirt saying that they won something that they really didn't win because we all know the shirts are made ahead of time so they can be bought immediately after the game is over. So of the 95% of textiles that can be recycled, what's the breakdown? Well, 45% of it is sold as secondhand or used, whether that's through Goodwill, Salvation Army, Texas Thrift, any of the other thrift stores around Texas and around the nation, Thread Up, Poshmark, some of the places that are on the internet that you can sell your clothes or you can go buy used clothing. 30% is made into wiping rags, which is what we do and how we fit in. And I had gotten rid of that too, but I guess it didn't stick. All right. And then 20% are ground into fibers that make other materials like insulation. There's a big company that makes a lot of denim insulation, and then 5% goes directly to landfill. Now, of the products that are either made into wiping rags or go into fiber, what comprises that? Well, so it's stuff that isn't good for selling in a store or being exported. So what does that look like? So we'll take stuff with a broken zipper. Why? I don't care if the zipper doesn't work. We're going to cut it off anyway. Is it stained? Well, as long as it's clean, I mean, I've got things that have stains that I still wear because I like them, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't prevent me from wearing it. And you know, it still would be an absorbent rag later. If it's torn, I mean, if you raise your arm and you tear the, um, the armpit of your shirt, it's still, the material's still good. I have, like I said earlier, I have shirts that my husband has worn till they have huge holes in them, but there's still good material left in there and then we make that into a wiping rag. If it's missing a button, we're gonna cut the buttons off anyway because they would scratch if it was in a wiping rag. And then a lot of times the, we save the buttons and we send them over to Austin Creative Reuse and then they take the buttons off the cloth and they resell the buttons and the buttons actually get made into jewelry and all sorts of fun crafts. Or if whatever you have is out of style or out of fashion and nobody wants to wear it, even if it's got a good zipper, it's not stained, it's not torn, all the buttons are there, but it's out of style, it's okay, nobody's gonna know later that it, it was out of style when it gets made into a rag. So why recycle textiles? Well, two billion tons of, rec of textiles are recycled each year in the United States. That is equivalent to removing one million cars off the highways. The impact on reducing greenhouse gases by textile recycling is equal to the combination of recycling yard materials, glass, and plastics. I think if we think about it in that, I mean, the only thing that impacts greenhouse gases more than textile recycling 
is aluminum recycling. So what is a reasonable goal for the textile collection, reuse, and recycling? If we're at 15%, where can we hope to be by 2025? This was a question asked in another webinar that I attended, and I liked it a lot because I think that it's something that we need to be thinking about because textile recycling is not at the top of mind for most people other than me and, and the rest of the SMART members. Um, so for 15% in five years, can we be at 25%, 45%, 75%, 90%? Okay, I'm gonna agree 90% is way too big for five years out. I'd like to see us at like at least at 25% and growing towards 45%. On another aspect, and I don't know enough about this to really speak confidently about this, but I know there's companies and programs working to increase sustainable fashion by new methods of fiber recycling, taking the fibers that are in existing garments and creating new garments. Um, I mean, there's people that are taking plastic bottles and making fabric to make um, like t-shirts and stuff. I actually have one like bought in Yellowstone. So how does JOSCO differentiate itself? Well, one of our core values is legacy. And to us, that means that we leave the planet in a better place, that we impact both economically and environmentally. We offer destruction services to local municipalities. And we participate in local programs to raise awareness in textile recycling, like Reverse Pitch and Move Out ATX, which are both by Austin Resource Recovery. Reverse Pitch is companies take their waste and they pitch it to entrepreneurs and see if somebody could come up with something cool out of the waste. Um, we pitched the tops of blue jeans and somebody wanted to make dog toys out of the pockets, which is a great idea. He didn't get the seed money and he chose not to participate in it any further, but I still have the prototypes and I'm hoping that somebody will want to take that up. And then Move Out ATX was a program with uh, the University of Texas to help students not throw their stuff away when they were leaving campus in their apartments. And we worked with um, Goodwill, Salvation Army, and Arms of Hope to recycle not only the clothing, but also the refrigerators and picture frames and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So Austin put together a map of textile recovery. So let me show this to you. So this is Austin's circular economy. And see this bright blue dot? This is the waste one. So we'll get to that in just a second. So this is where JOSCO products sits in the circular economy in Austin. And then this is the map of the textile material outlets. So we're down here in textile recycling. And then here's all the other things that are out there. Here's you know, the Austin Reach um, directory, and then there's rental and there's hospitality. So it's really kind of a cool map of everything that's happening in Austin on textile recycling. So when we talk about end of life in terms of textiles, so like I said, we'll take t-shirts and we'll put them in boxes and sell them to paint stores. We sell to paint stores and janitorial supply houses and oil field supply houses and contractor supply stores. Um, we sell cabinet manufacturers. So there's a lot of places, but by the end of the use of that rag, it's full of paint or stain or oil or something else, but it has fully been utilized and then it, it, it has come to its end of life. So how can we all help? I'm going to ask all of you to spread the word that just because you don't want to wear it or you don't want somebody else to wear it like an EMS t-shirt or t-shirt proclaiming your team won when it didn't, it doesn't have to the landfill. There's a place it can go to be fully utilized. So, and the thing is that people want to know what happens to their old clothes when they get rid of them. I mean, whether, you know, they give it to a charity to help with the hurricane victims, I'm sure that's going to be happening fairly shortly or they know that it's not going to be able to be used, but they want it to be useful. So thank you very much for listening. My name is Colleen Halbrook. I'm the CEO of JOSCO Products. There's my information. I would be happy to talk with any of you at any time in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. That is some really great information and it shows that there's a lot of life in our clothes after we're done with them. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us today. 
Next up, we are going to hear from Jeff Payne with Break It Down in Austin, and he's going to talk to us about composting in your community. Jeff, take it away. All right. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, going to talk about composting. There's a lot of different types and degrees of composting that can occur in communities. So I'm going to kind of move around to talk about some different areas and types of, of composting, give you a sense of the trend in the industry uh, and where things are heading, but also to try to leave everyone with a sense of what sort of options could be available in your community, depending on where you're at. Uh, so I wanted to briefly introduce, break it down, and then kind of just jump right into some of the different options and tiers of, of composting that are out there. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so <laughs> break it down. My wife and I started break it down in 2009. Uh, we serviced the Greater Austin area. We started with just two clients. It was a uh, a test case. I was a grad student at UT at the time. And there was no cart size, cart, cart service for composting in the area. But there were some businesses that were starting to want to redirect their food wastes from the landfill. Uh, so we started with two. We were composting in a friend's backyard. Uh, as we added more customers, we started composting at a community garden. And as we added even more customers, and now we're at 800 plus, uh, we started taking material to a commercial uh, composting facility. So we've kind of run the gamut from small to big over the last 11 years. And we'll see a little bit of how that plays in with the different options that are available out there for composting. Uh, we have a picture of our truck here on the slide. And I just wanted to make a brief note that that's not a typical uh, vehicle for picking up food waste. We're a little bit unconventional. The industry standard typically involves what everyone's familiar with, a rear load garbage truck. Uh, occasionally you'll see a side load garbage truck. Uh, what happens with those vehicles is that the carts are left behind. Uh, and so the carts stay at the resident or the business's site permanently. Uh, what we found uh, certainly with businesses is that there is an improved service quality when you're swapping the carts. You can imagine a bin that holds food waste and maybe it's got meat or dairy or who knows what, uh, all kinds of types of food waste. Those carts can get pretty gross over time. So swapping them out every pickup and rinsing the dirty ones makes a big difference. Uh, a break it down does primarily business to business services. And we also provide business to business recycling in town for the traditional uh, single stream items, glass, paper, uh, metal, et cetera. Uh, we do have some experience with residential composting though. We've, we've run that service for residents in the greater Austin area, primarily in apartments. Um, and most of the talk, Moving forward, I want to focus on the residential side because I think that's my understanding is that that is what people are more interested in. I'm certainly happy to uh, handle questions on either area, though. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. One of the uh, things I'm going to talk about with each of the different slides and all of these uh, different options is that there's different components when we talk about compost we have to keep in mind that there's a hauling component right how are we going to get the food waste from where it's uh, generated to where it can be processed then there is the whole processing component uh, what type of material are we dealing with and so what do we need to do to process that material effectively uh, to process it without nuisance conditions and to keep in mind the various regulations that exist in our case with TCEQ, uh, also sometimes at the county and the city level, depending on where you're at. Uh, there are also educational considerations that need to be taken into account. 
Now, if we just have a compost bin, uh, like the one in the upper right there, and we're doing it in our backyard, there's not a whole lot of educational concerns at the community level, right? Obviously, the individual resident needs to educate themselves on what to put in there. But at the community level, there's not a whole lot of work or effort done. When we get to large scale composting, residential uh, hauling services like what Austin, Texas has for residents, education becomes perhaps the most important and essential element to a successful program. Uh, let's see, some of the other pictures I have here and other different options we'll talk about. For example, upper left is a yard waste pickup. A lot of communities have. Uh, services currently just for simple green wastes. So your lawn trimmings, grass, leaves, small branches, et cetera. Um, it's relatively easy to have a composting system for that type of material because it's fairly benign. The regulations are pretty low. Uh, it's fairly easy to handle. Sometimes it can just even be mulched. Uh, and some processors, at the industrial level, like what we see in the bottom right, have a demand for those yard trimmings. They need it to mix with all the other more putrescible material uh, to get that decent finished product. So sometimes there's even a need for it. Uh, I got a picture of a community garden on the bottom left. We'll touch base on that as an option for composting. <clears throat> I think what we're seeing in the industry as a whole and in communities in different parts of the country in general is that there's a slow trend from uh, communities going from where there's just residents composting by themselves or maybe residents composting at community gardens towards what we have, for example, in Austin or in some places on the West Coast and uh, Minneapolis does it on other communities where you have that triple bin system, like what I've illustrated there in the middle, where, where residents have carts for trash, recycling, and food waste compost with uh, yard waste. So I think that's the trend we're headed towards. Whether and how that gets adopted over time by different areas, I think will will greatly depend on the demand of residents and the uh, the availability of funding too, which is an important consideration. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I've touched base on what I'm calling grassroots composting a little bit already. Uh, I like to think of the two primary areas of grassroots composting would be backyard composting that a resident does on their own or a slightly larger scale community garden composting the two pictures here you know that could be in someone's backyard or that could be at a community garden uh, there's a lot of different ways to do a uh, small scale composting I'd be more inclined to believe these are both photos from community card composting because one of the things you run into as a resident when you're composting yourself is that frankly it's hard to generate enough food waste out of just your kitchen even if you're cooking two three meals a day it's hard to generate enough food waste to really have a successful compost pile that's going to generate some finished product for your garden uh, in my experience, when I've done this in the past, I had to actively bring in additional food waste just to get enough usable product for my garden. Not that you won't generate some that you can use, um, but in my opinion, the best part about backyard composting is really more about the waste diversion than it is about the finished product directly. Um, I think another benefit is that you don't have to take out the trash as often because it doesn't stink. And that might sound like a small or, or a silly reason, but I, I find that a nice benefit that uh, you keep your trash cans from stinking as much. Um, community garden composting really can run the gamut from very small systems like what we might see a picture here where there's maybe 20 or 30 residents bringing in their food waste to um, 
examples like Sunshine Community Gardens in Austin, where they've done a lot more composting. They've got a front loader that they use to turn a pile that's uh, you know bigger than a car. Uh, when Break It Down was getting started in the early years, uh, we were hauling, I don't know, a few tons a, month, a week, something like that. And we would tip it all at the community garden. So we really helped boost the amount of composting they were doing. So there's not as much educational work required with these systems, again, because most people involved have taken the effort to educate themselves. Uh, there's also fairly minimal time or cost to get started. All you really need is some food waste and yard trimmings, and I'm not going to go into how to make a, a successful pile in this talk, but um, as you can see from some of these pictures, there's very little cost that needs to be thrown in the beginning. A bunch of spare pallets uh, is literally enough. Certainly, if you want to spend hundreds of dollars, you can buy nicer bins. There are added benefits to those, uh, especially aesthetically. Uh, it can, I think, really depend on what the yard looks, what the quantity of material is like, and, and what your end goal is. <clears throat> One important thing to note with grassroots composting is that it typically is only going to be focused on your fruits and vegetables mixed with yard trimmings. So, uh, there's a lot of other food waste products that don't make it into this type of composting. So meat, bones, dairy products. Breads and grains can be composted, but uh, oftentimes they're kept out. They can attract rodents. So um, one thing to keep in mind throughout this whole talk I'm giving is that not all composting is the same in that We've got different scales, but we've also got different types of materials going in. Uh, so on the whole, if there's a downside to grassroots composting, and I can't tell if that spot on the side got cut off there from you all, but I would say it's, it's not as impactful as whole community composting as far as landfill diversion. Now, it can be really impactful as far as getting people excited about it and helping people learn about it. So from the perspective of crawling before you walk, before you run, uh, if you're a community and there's almost no grassroots composting going on, I'd say it's very unlikely that you're gonna just jump straight into a full-blown residential composting service. Uh, not enough people will know about it to kind of get that public support behind it. Uh, one of the things that the city of Austin started with before their residential surface. Originally, they had a rebate program for composting bins for people in the community. So if you were a homeowner and you wanted to buy a compost bin, uh, you could fill out some paperwork, send in your receipt, and the city would refund you 50 or $80 or something for your bin. Uh, not all communities can afford that, and some might say maybe that's not even worth the cost but on the positive side it did get people more enthusiastic about it it did help generate a little more interest and excitement and discussion around composting and you really can't undervalue some of uh some of that to get the ball rolling as far as building a long-term successful program to divert more and more material over time um there's also an opportunity for businesses to get involved in grassroots composting. Uh, certainly um, local restaurants that really want to go that extra mile and separate their food waste out. If they've got a lot of mostly fruit and veggie material, they could link up with a community garden, figure out a way to get it there. Of course, keep in mind, you obviously you got the hauling aspect that still needs to be taken into account. But um, uh, that certainly can and, and has happened in the past with businesses. Uh, let's jump to the next uh, page and talk about kind of next level composting. So this is uh, an educational guide borrowed from San Marcos. Uh, they're just south of us. Uh, and at this point, education is becoming more of a concern. As you can see, they've got this whole sorting guide available. 
Now, San Marcos doesn't accept food wastes in their green cart. So they're a good example of what I mentioned earlier about the green waste system, where they're mostly taking plants, leaves, and grass clippings in that. I like the sorting guide, though, because it reminds us that there are some other things that can go in there. There's kitchen paper products, paper towels, napkins, uh, pizza boxes, dirty cardboard. Um, uh, if you've been to uh, various to-go restaurants lately, probably we all have, some of them are using compostable serviceware uh, that they're going to give you the food in. Maybe it's compostable sugarcane bagasse. Uh, plates or cups. So just because it's plants and leaves, there are other types of items that can be accepted in these green cart programs. The underlying theme is it's all uh, fairly carbonaceous as opposed to nitrogenous food waste. The high nitrogen material is where there's the greater risk of, um, of nuisance conditions related to pests, flies, rodents, smells, etc. Uh, obviously, a successful program at any level shouldn't have a whole lot of nuisance conditions. There, uh, there are laws preventing that, um, but certainly, you know, a small community garden doesn't want to be handling meat, or they're going to have a problem. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Another thing to keep in mind with these green card services is that they can often be bi-weekly. Uh, because there's no nuisance material in them, grass, leaves, all that can sit around in the bin for a little bit of time without creating a problem. So because it's bi-weekly, because it's relatively benign material, and because various compost facilities are needing that woody debris, there's oftentimes a cheaper entry point for communities looking to get a, a green cart or a green waste program going. Uh, you don't even have to have the nice roll carts that some communities like San Marcos have. I think we're all familiar with the heavy duty paper bags you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, oftentimes those work just fine. Uh, the city ran a bulk pickup service in Austin uh, for quite a long time before the carts where it was just those heavy duty bags or bundles of twigs uh, tied together with twine. So um, for all of those different reasons, it's a cheaper entry point for communities to get into this. Sometimes the local haulers that have their own compost facility may even offer to do it for free. Uh, that's in the case with San Marcos as an example. The hauler for them that does their trash and recycling added that on as a freebie. Now, I think we'll talk about free a little bit more on the next slide that we can go to. Free isn't always free. Uh, sometimes it's just in tandem with increased trash rates, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. So talking about kind of the final tier where maybe the community is running now with food waste composting. Uh, this is where education becomes really critical. Uh, picture I have here is a flyer uh, by the city of Austin that they put out uh, regarding what can I compost. And it's probably hard for a lot of you to read the writing on that. And it's hard for me to read it. And I think that really illustrates the point of how do you communicate all the materials to keep out all the materials to put in, do it succinctly, and have the words large enough that people will actually read it and see it and look at it. The, the effort is significantly higher here, and it's, it's rather difficult. You almost hope that people don't participate as opposed to participate poorly, uh, because contamination, because becomes a really big deal here. If you've got a large compost facility and you're handling a lot of different materials, it only takes one glass bottle to go in and get crushed and you have a bunch of glass mixed in with finished compost and someone goes and buys it and goes to use it in their garden, that's a liability. So uh, it's, it's really important to have a lot of educational material uh, 
some items are always going to get in. It's inevitable, but uh, it's definitely uh, a next level situ situation. Um, typically, at least from what I, my experience is, and certainly in the city of Austin is a good example of this, uh, separate requests for proposals will be made by the city for the actual education. So Austin does its own hauling of trash and recycling. And so they added in a cart for composting. So the city of Austin does its own hauling for compost as well. They have a contract for the processor that takes the material from them. And they have a contract for multiple different companies that have helped with education to help educate people. Sometimes it's literally going door to door uh, in various neighborhoods. They've also tried doing flyers, certainly trying to train the, um, the handlers with the garbage trucks to identify trash and then tag carts that have problems. So there, there's different strategies that can be employed there. Now, not all cities are going to be doing their own hauling. I think most smaller cities, if I'm not mistaken, tend to contract out to one of the national waste haulers or regional waste hauler for their recycling and trash. Uh, and so composting could be an opportunity there to talk to that hauler and say, hey, what can we do to divert some material out of the landfill? From the hauler's perspective, they're still hauling the same amount of material. So it's still a win for them. Uh, it mostly comes down to, is there the processing capacity available locally to handle that diverted material? Uh, and that's where the processing capacity for green waste is oftentimes better than for adding in all the extra food wastes down the road, especially when you start looking at the costs to haul all that material and the cost to process it most importantly. But then again, also the cost of education too. Uh, so it is more expensive. As I mentioned, it's typically, composting is typically sold as free in tandem with increased trash rates. I, I'm not a public policy expert. That's probably just inevitable. Although I've, I've never really appreciated that from the standpoint that it's, it oftentimes feels disingenuous to me. Um, I think maybe sometimes it gives the impression that this food waste is super valuable because we can haul it for free when the reality is it is a cost to the community. So, you know, there's just some thoughts that are worth keeping in mind as we go down that road of <clears throat> having more composting and throughout the, the industry. Um, I think that sums up that area of food waste. I'm obviously not touching on why do we want to compost and all those questions. I'm assuming that that would be for a different talk. I certainly can comment on it if anyone wants. Uh, I think the last slide that I have here is on business composting. And these are all different containers that Break It Down uses for its customers. Um, Business composting shouldn't be forgotten about in the overall strategy of a community to compost. We mostly talked about the residential, but there's a significant fraction of food waste tonnage tied up with all the restaurants in a community. Um, sometimes it can be greater than the amount of food waste generated in the community itself. <clears throat> uh, just depend on how many households we have and how many restaurants we have. Um, the difference with business composting in my perspective is that it's it's much heavier on the logistics side as far as businesses aren't all producing the same type of material uh, and they don't all have the same needs so residents are are fairly simple from the standpoint that you can have one cart and you pick it up every week and you're going to send a truck down the street once a week and you're done uh, but with businesses just as one example, we prefer to give everyone the green cart you see in this picture, the one on the left that says compost only. Uh, but some of the businesses, the food is so wet and so heavy that it'll literally just break the wheels off of that axle. 
<clears throat> and so for those customers, we give them that blue barrel uh, because they're virtually indestructible. We've been using some of those blue barrels for 10 years now, every week, and they're still going. Uh, I don't think a green cart would ever make it that long. Um, we also have those black carts because sometimes the customer needs a bigger bin but they don't have enough space to hold more containers. And so that black card is a little bit taller. Um, there, there can be other reasons to use the black one, just trying to keep it uh, looking a little bit different, or maybe it makes it easier to move more material at a time. Uh, conversely, we also use the smaller 13 gallon green bin a bit for uh, offices. Uh, that's an area that isn't usually on the top of everyone's list when you think about composting, but if you have enough office people uh, and they're all eating lunch and making coffee, you're going to start to have a little bit of food waste in there. Uh, and what we see in Austin increasingly with all the tech companies is that they're catering food in or half of them even have their own kitchens these days. A significant amount of food waste can be generated in those settings. Uh, so there's different size bins depending on what type of business needs there are, how much material they're generated, what kind of material it is, et cetera. Um, it's, it's more logistics heavy, like I said. The education is kind of all in the hands of the business. So while there is that educational component still, it's generally left up to the business. Uh, now certainly some of them will reach out and talk to us uh, and say, hey, we have a question about this, we have a question about that. Break It Down has educational material we can provide. We can send people in to talk to them and help them. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to train their employees to know what goes in the bin and what doesn't. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, certainly happy to answer questions. There's a, a number of different areas about composting I didn't touch on, um, but I think this gets to the heart of the different types and degrees of composting that is available in communities, ways that you can slowly look to uh, divert more material from the landfill. So thank you for your attention and your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Payne. If um, anyone has any questions for him, just hang on to him and we'll be able to get to those at the end. I appreciate your presentation today. You got to learn a lot about like everything we do could create green waste and food waste. And so it's good to see that composting is a way to help divert it from the waste stream. Um, I think that maybe um, a good transition to our next presenter is another way to keep it out of the waste stream is to never even let it get that close. And so I'd like to welcome Mr. John Crager with the Montgomery County Food Bank, who's going to present about how food banks are part of that zero waste solution. Mr. Crager? Yes, good morning. I appreciate the opportunity. Can, can you hear me? I can, and we can see your okay. screen. That's great. Okay, awesome. Well, I am uh, here today to really tell you about um, you know, how food banks or you know help with the zero waste uh, goal uh, and really they were set up to always be, be that all right um, so hold on I lost my, my presentation there we go all right so food banks are part of the, the food waste solution uh, back in the early 60s, uh, this gentleman here, uh, John Van Hegel, uh, worked at a, he was retired. Sorry, Sorry so he, he's retired, he's working at a soup kitchen. Um, and then um, he would go out and solicit a product. Well, one day, a one of his clients, one of, a, a lady actually, a, a, a young woman, she actually had ten kids, and they would come to the soup line uh, quite frequently. They, uh, she told them that there was a lot of food that she gets from behind the uh, grocery store, out of the dumpster, and she thought, man, wouldn't it be great if uh, 
if we could, you know, somehow like a bank uh, store that food and then uh, be able to, uh, you know, get withdrawals from it ever, ever, you know, wherever you need it. And that really got uh, John thinking about the concept of a food bank. And actually in 1967, the first one was, uh, was formed in uh, St. Mary's. Um, actually, John went on then, he didn't stop there. Uh, he ended up getting some grants and uh, he founded uh, Feeding America. And really, so from 67 on into the 70s and, and early 80s, Food banking really caught on. Now uh, it was called America's Second Harvest. It's now called Feeding America. There's 200 food banks across the country, uh, and we're just we're just one of those food banks. Uh, a little bit closer to home in Texas, there's 21 food banks, um, and every those different colors are different uh, territories that each food bank uh, takes care of. So. Every county really in the United States is covered by a food bank. Like I said, there's 200 across the, uh, the country. There is uh, 21 in, in Texas. Closer to home still, the Houston Food Bank, they, they cover 18 counties. And uh, we're considered, Montgomery County Food Bank there in blue in the center is considered a PDO, a partner distribution organization. So, a uh, separate entity, but we report all of our poundage and stuff and work through the, the Houston Food Bank, along with the Brazos Valley Food Bank, which is in green there, and the Galveston County Food Bank, uh, which is down lower. So again, all separate entities, uh, but we report and work with both Houston Food Bank and then through Feeding America. And Feeding Texas is kind of our, our arm in, in Austin. So that's a little video about the Montgomery County Food Bank and uh, what we do. Uh, so we work with 70 partner agencies uh, and these could be, you know, pantry schools, shelters. These are all uh, what we call our partner agencies that distribute the food. Food banks uh, don't normally distribute directly to individuals. There's a couple of ways we do it. We do mobiles and especially through the pandemic, we've had to change a lot of our models where we do mobiles, we're drive-through through models. Um, 
but normally we, we work through agencies and shelters and living facilities. So food banks, really the whole, the whole concept of a food bank is uh, we're opportunistic, I guess you'd say. So we capture uh, what, what other people call waste, uh, but uh, in that waste, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of good product, right? Uh, it's just the food bank's job to, to secure that. And with the help of volunteers, we'll sort through that, clean out all the good product, uh, and then uh, feed, feed people with, with the good product. Uh, the other side of that is, you know, we uh, recycle everything else. Here's just some ideas of how a food bank gets gets product, right? So short dated product. So this this is stuff maybe in the grocery store that's getting too close, or even at the distribution centers uh, that is too close to send out. Uh, we actually can distribute out of date. I mean, as most of you might know, the 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 code dates that on them are on products are really just best if used by uh, dates, and the USDA has they, they have this guide it's called the food keepers guide and that's what we go by it actually shows how how long the product is actually good for um, and and that's that's what we use when we're sorting through product with the food bank uh, food safety is our number one concern though uh, so we really go overboard and, and a little bit more strict uh, on 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 uh, not taking any chances to, to send stuff out that uh, might hurt hurt somebody, you know. Uh, other examples: discontinued item, damaged product. So, you know, damaged product. There there are limits. Uh, like if there's a 50 pound bag of, or any kind of a bag of product that has a hole in it, uh, unfortunately, uh, if that happens, we can't use it. Uh, once it's been compromised, uh, we have to. It has to be thrown away. Off spec items. There's there's a lot of uh, times. Uh, just for instance, uh, you know, fruit and vegetables. Uh, they have to look a certain way. Uh, and then and then uh, manufacturing too. Food manufacturing. They could just be off a little bit. I mean, they're putting their name on it. And if they're if they're off a little bit, uh, they'll share that with with food banks. Because if you if you Thinking about it from a company's uh, point of view, uh, if they have to throw something away, that, that's a cost. Uh, so that's the where the partnerships come in place with with companies and food banks. And we really help reduce their their waste costs. Uh, processing drops. What I, what I mean by that is uh, an example. We had a company uh, that's making lunch meat. Uh, and if you like trim the, the corners and the sides and stuff, um, they probably could reprocess that back into it, but they, they didn't. And uh, they just uh, bagged that up for, for the food banks to be able to use. So uh, that's what I mean by it. just different uh, manufacturing processes that generates uh, extra product for us. Um, and then when you think about a food bank, you know, we're, we're all nonprofits. Uh, we work on a very tight budget and uh, boxes, if any of you ever try to purchase any, they're, they're real expensive. And you, you pay up to you know, three or $4 for a box, uh, especially ones like a banana box or something that we like to use, like the hardy rewards. So getting uh, boxes donated and different supplies, that's something that we really look for and again, it's it's waste to a, another company, right? Uh, they would be either bailing it or, or uh, hopefully not going to landfill, but sometimes it, it was. Uh, we were rescuing that from, from the landfill. Uh, overruns, uh, they just made too much. That, that's an easy one. A lot of growers uh, will allow uh, organizations to glean their fields. Uh, so we do that. And then, uh, Actually, a lot of uh, product is converted. There's a food bank in Arkansas, like if they have excess tomatoes, they'll actually do a, a tomato sauce. They have a manufacturing facility there that they use. 
So all different, all these ways are examples how uh, you know the food banks were able to keep product from the from the landfills uh, and and do good with it, right? So so people are fed with it. We have very uh, good partners. You know, we can't do uh, what we do really without the, our partners. Uh, there's a program that they started probably six, seven years ago, maybe even eight, uh, called the Retail Pickup Program. So this is where they allow the food banks to come to their stores, uh, some, some of them up to seven times a week. And you're really just, you're picking up their I guess you'd call them coals, the stuff off the shelf, you know, like again, close dated stuff, uh, stuff they don't want to uh, put out there and put their name on anymore. Uh, and we'll actually pick that up, bring it back to the food bank and, and glean through it. You know, so we will go through it, get all the bad stuff out and then uh, distribute what's good. So again, uh, keeping stuff out of the landfills uh, and then feeding people with it. Um, about, well, in April 2017, we started something here we call a Produce Rescue Center. Um, so what that was, so a little, little bit of background of, my, uh, of mine, I, I worked for the Houston Food Bank for 11 years uh, and always in sourcing. And uh, I, we'd have 18 wheeler back up to our docks so, of, you know, full of produce wanting to donate produce but it could be that that, that truckload had you know something happened and 30 percent of it uh, 30 percent 40 percent uh might be bad uh we we had no way of uh of gleaning that out or our uh you know handling it we just weren't set up to do that we'd have to turn it away and it would end up going to the landfill um so with dow's help uh in april 2017 17 we started a produce rescue center we've got a little video here that i want to uh hopefully i can pull up give me just a second all right so i i don't that one that one wouldn't load so we're going to skip that so what it was um I, there, there was a, uh, I had an advisory board at, at Houston and I kind of told them my dreams. Um, anyway, Dow came to me and said, we have a way to uh, help you and maybe save more produce. Uh, so the way this process works, uh, we get rejected produce, just like I mentioned earlier, you know, loads show up at our docks. Now we, we accept those loads uh, with the help of volunteers uh, we, we, we glean through it. Uh, the good product uh, will either uh, go to individuals or one of the uh, other things that Dow uh, came up with, they have a, a film uh, that they designed, the engineered, uh, that extends the shelf life. Uh, so thanks to their help as well, we got a packaging machine donated from the General uh, Equipment Packaging Company. and um, we bag produce and it'll extend the shelf life. We'll get in that a little bit, little bit later as far as how that works and, and what it does. But it, on this slide, the, the product, so the product that, that we glean out that's not good for consumption, we actually have a partnership with Living Earth and they compost it um, and make the soil mix with that. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go back to the, to the lower half of that slide a little bit later, uh, but that's, that's kind of how the produce rescue center works. So we glean everything out, and at the same time, you know, we're recycling the the uh, cardboard. Uh, we're recycling the plastic. We started a program where we're recycling the plastic too. So we keep everything uh, out of the, out of the landfill. So the packaging machine I was uh, telling you about. So this is romaine lettuce, and and keep in mind when the food bank gets a lot of the, the products they get, it might be toward the end of its life already. Uh, this is some romaine lettuce. This is actually a day, day five of uh, after the, we started this test. So the, the uh, romaine on the left was, was bagged. Uh, the romaine on the right was not. So you can even see it at five days, 
uh, the one on the right that's not bagged, it starts breaking down. And if you look at 10 days, uh, really 10 days, uh, the romaine on the right is ready for the, uh, the composter, uh, but the, the bagged uh, romaine lettuce still looks good. So what this, what this does for the food bank, it gives us another tool uh, you know, we try to we try to send uh, our product out as quick as we can you know, because it is perishable. Uh, but this gives us some time uh, to to one to to get it out of the food bank, and then you, I was saying we work through partners, right? So it has to go to an agency, and then a client has to pick it up. So it just gives more time for the client uh, to have good fresh produce that's some other items here that we uh you know so we did find out that the the bagging doesn't work on on uh every product um and and it, there is a cost to that it's a little bit less than three cents a bag so food banks don't like to add cost but uh if the return on investment is, is good enough then then we go with it in this case this is broccoli we really didn't start seeing a a change um, until about day 15. You see some uh, the one on the right that was not bagged is starting to break down a little bit and actually lose some moisture. Uh, then even at day 22, the broccoli on the on the left is still good. Uh, the broccoli on the right is, is definitely not not good. Carrots. Carrots one that surprised us. Uh, so. This is day five. You can already see the difference in the, in the size of the carrot. So the the moisture loss has been uh, been a lot, right? I mean, you're you're losing quite a bit. I'll tell you, uh, the carrots on the on the were not bagged or flimsy. They're not crisp. Uh, and the, even at day ten, uh, the bagged carrots were really crisp. Uh, so it made made quite quite a difference. Um, so again, what 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 that bagging machine does is really helps keep helps us capture more of the product that that we have, keeping it out of the landfill. And again, at the same time, we're uh, we're uh, keeping all the plastic and stuff too, and recycling the plastic. This is an example. Uh, so after we glean products, we actually build mixed produce boxes. Uh, this is an example of a 30 pound box that we build uh, so stuff that really we captured from the landfill most of it uh, we can build boxes that we send out and it's uh, i mean that's that's good looking stuff right there and, and families love it we i mentioned something earlier uh or you saw it we have an internal goal of 50 percent of everything that we send out we want to be fresh produce um, and, and the Produce Rescue Center is, is definitely helping with that. We couldn't do without what we do without volunteers. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to, to our volunteers because uh, we, we have a staff of 22 um, and we put out uh, at normally before COVID about a million pounds a month. Um, uh, just off topic a little bit, COVID, we, we jumped up to 1.8 uh for two months then down to 1.5 and now we're at about 1.4 so we're still up but thank you volunteers um, i told you we started the rescue center in, in april of 2017 this is kind of uh where we stand so since then uh the produce rescue center and our volunteers and the produce rescue center has rescued over uh, 12 million pounds uh, from landfills so if you if you uh, a truck load 18 wheeler loads about 40,000 pounds, so that that comes up to around 300 truck loads uh, that has been rescued from uh, from the landfill uh, since April of 2017, and really we have a, uh, a pretty good save rate. Uh, it's about it, it varies, you know, because uh, sometimes you get stuff that's really bad and sometimes okay, but well, we still average around 80% save. And then uh, the stuff, again, we don't send it to the landfill, it goes to the uh, composting partner, Living, Living Earth. 
so back to the uh, that other slide I showed earlier. So I want to explain the bottom part. So we're we're wanting to take this one step further. We're working on taking it one step further. So we're already capturing uh, the produce and they're making that soil mix out of it. So the next thing we're doing, we're, we're capturing our plastic now. Uh, our goal here or what we're working toward is we're gonna have a bag made from recycled plastic, from that recycled plastic. I think 30% of it is gonna be uh, made from that. Uh, and we're gonna hopefully start bagging our own uh, so it'll be a Montgomery County Food Bank soil mix made from the produce uh, that we've uh, gleaned out and from the plastic that we've gleaned out as well. So just part of the like a, a circular economy, I, I guess you'd say. And I just wanted to put this out there. You know, one thing that the uh, food banks struggle with, all food banks across the country struggle with, is our distribution. Uh, so being perishable items. We have to keep it cool. This is a, a concept that we started um, called the Produce Pod, and thanks to Kroger for sponsoring it. Uh, but I worked with Huntsman uh, on designing it because they're in, they do a lot of insulation. So that's just a, a really a portable walk-in cooler that we pick up. We can drop it into a uh, you know church parking lot or pantry parking lot. Uh, as you see there, the picture on the left, uh, it is cooled just by a window unit. So a regular window unit you could buy at the, at the uh, hardware store. Uh, it, it, there's some technology called CoolBot uh, that really overrides the controls and tricks it into thinking it's not as cold as it is. Uh, but even in Houston in July and August, uh, we could keep uh, you know, 40 degrees uh, temperature in, in that in that pod so uh, we've had that on the road for about almost two years now uh, and uh, just with one pod we can distribute an extra almost half a million pounds per year uh, through the pod and uh, this is just one of our distributions I just wanted to throw kids in there with uh, uh, with some produce that we give away that we, we that was a school that I think it's a low-income school and everybody got some produce that day. Um, so I know it went kind of quick, but uh, if y'all have any questions, if, if y'all ever want to do a tour, uh, and I do want to say too, we have a, uh, a VISTA uh, that's been approved, a VISTA position that's been approved through Feeding Texas, uh, that we're looking for some help in the Produce Rescue Center. Do I know anybody that's interested in doing a VISTA program? It's not a lot of money, uh, but it'd be a great experience. And uh, uh, we, we would welcome the help. But if y'all ever want a tour or something, please reach out to me and I'd love to give you a tour and uh, I'd love to learn from y'all about how we could uh, uh, you know, save, save more produce and uh, keep stuff out of the landfill. So thank you and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Krager, and thank you for sharing uh, how we can keep this food waste from even getting close to the landfill. You're able to rescue it and repurpose it, and that's what we've been talking about today, being able to find new life and reuse something that maybe seems like it's at the end of its life but has more life to give. And to wrap things up, I want to say construction materials also can do that. So we are going to hear from Mr. Keith Kosky with the Houston Reuse Warehouse, who's going to tell us about 10 years of their program, challenges, successes, and some of the unexpected. Mr. Kosky? Okay, well, good morning. It's great to be here and great to follow uh, um, lots of these uh, uh, wonderful presentations. And uh, see if I can Okay, um, just a second here. Mr. Kosky, okay. I have it available if you want me to share it, or do you have it? Uh, I should have it now. I believe I'm sharing. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, great. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here, and uh, 
uh, invited by the Houston Galveston Area Council. Um, and uh, so uh, this is the City of Houston reuse warehouse for building materials. And uh, uh, we were established in 2009. And uh, we're on the north end of Main Street in Houston, Texas. And so uh, uh, once again, it is a pleasure to be at this workshop. You'll uh, In today's presentation, you'll see how the HGAC figures very, very much in our success over time. And uh, okay. so what we do is uh, the Reuse Warehouse accepts building material from anyone, that's individuals, companies, anyone from anywhere, keeps it out of landfills, and gives it to nonprofit organizations for free. Uh, we don't sell or give material to the general public and there's no charge for drop-offs or collections. So money, no money comes in and no money goes out, which differs from a lot of reuse facilities. Um, it is the only reuse facility of its kind in the United States that is run by a municipal government, does not charge for any exchanges, and provides material to communities through nonprofit organizations, also schools, universities, and government agencies. There are a lot of um, reuse facilities that are run by nonprofits or for-profits, and even some after uh, storms such as in Galveston or New Orleans that are ad hoc and just form where people bring material and other people take it. Uh, this is a brief history. This is our building a few years ago, um, which, uh, by the way, uh, one thing I would like to uh, kind of uh, stress uh, today is how other cities can start a program like this. We've had some some inquiries from around the country and we're currently talking to San Francisco about getting a program going there. Um, so uh, back in 2004 and 5, there's a joint study by the Houston Galveston Area Council and the Houston Area Research Center that revealed that C&D waste or construction material waste accounted for 38 percent of the waste stream in the Houston area. And that kind of runs with the world estimates for around 40%. Uh, in 2007, uh, we had an Office of Environmental Programming in the mayor's office, and uh, that office identified air quality and landfill reduction as two main areas of focus. Um, an abandoned city property that I used to see all the time and think this would be a great place for an artist or something. Uh, but uh, it was identified and secured for future landfill reduction use. And this is very key to a city wishing to start a program like this uh, where a nonprofit might be at a disadvantage is uh, the cities often, especially larger cities, have unused properties that they can uh, put to use. And that really cuts the cost. And it's a big uh, load bearing issue for a nonprofit to pay rent each month and uh, balance the books and that sort of thing. I also want to say it's advantageous to have a building, let's say with an open canopy and a good secure fence around it with lots of room for both parking and to store materials outside. Um, and that's what we uh, were lucky enough to have here. Uh, the program was adopted by our Department of Solid Waste Management uh, back in 2009. Uh, that's when I uh, uh, joined up and uh, was uh, fortunate to be hired as the first manager. And uh, one condition was to place the, the neighborhood depository and recycling center on an adjoining property, one of six in town. So here's an aerial view, and uh, you'll see the reuse warehouse on the right, uh, the beige steel building. And then uh, on the left, you'll see that neighborhood depository, which was completed in 2010. Uh, so then residents, there's six of these in the city, so residents can drop off uh, heavy trash, but also it's a recycling center for, you know, plastic bottles, glass bottles, cardboard, uh, glass, motor oil, um, and, and then also uh, mattresses. The uh, Houston Furniture Bank has a couple of containers there where we, uh, citizens can uh, recycle mattresses and box springs and also clothes. The building in the middle was also uh, uh, renovated in uh, 2015, and that uh, houses our community outreach for the entire city, but also elements of community outreach for the reuse warehouse program. 
Uh, I don't have a picture today, but I, we, during this uh, pandemic, I've had the time to get the workshop going, made completely out of uh, reused materials, and we also have an assembly room in this space. And you'll see in the parking lot that you know various and sundry materials are stacked around, and that's a, that's a key point. Some of the other reuse facilities uh, maybe don't have that kind of space around. One of the key value items for reuse is uh, uh, things like bricks and other landscape material that carry a high value and can be just left outside to get rained on. Um, okay, so back in during that time, these are some of the key players, but there were many people who came uh, from many disciplines to get together. Uh, Amanda Tullis with the Living Paradigm uh, nonprofit, Sheila Blake, Sheila Blake, who was head of uh, permitting at the city of Houston at the time, and uh, Dan Phillips, um, uh, the founder of uh, Phoenix Commotion uh, up in Huntsville. We'll see a picture of, of uh, that later, but uh, just one of the main uh, building materials reuse mentors in the area. And I really invite you to look up uh, Dan's story and look up uh, Phoenix Commotion. On the right is Sarah Mason. She's my supervisor. Uh, she headed this team to get this program going uh, back during that time. And she is now the uh, division manager over recycling in all of the city. So, uh, and you'll see in the background uh, just, you know, how empty it was. It's no, lo no longer empty. <laughs> uh, and a few purchased materials there, but most of the, the, the storage has been donated over the years. Um, this was our, our main predecessor is the Trash into Plowshares program. Uh, headed up by Dan and, and the city of Huntsville. Uh, and uh, this is sort of a an un, unpeopled drop-off area uh, where those who are going to the city dump can just tip off to the side material that they feel is reusable. And then other people who register can come in and take that material. Um, and then uh, uh, being that that's up in the Texas Piney Woods area, there are a lot of forestry products there. They tend to get a lot of wood, uh, good reusable wood there. Uh, there's a, one of the buildings built out of the, uh, diverted from the landfill, just pulled from the dumpster, let's say, uh, by uh, the uh, Phoenix Commotion Mentorship Program right there. Um, we got a lot of our initial grant funding through the Houston Galveston Area Council. And that is one uh, aspect of, you know, if a city plans to do this, municipalities can apply for a solid waste reduction grant through our community of governments, the HGAC, and uh, I'm sure through other communities of governments in throughout Texas and, and the country. So it, it really helps with key uh, equipment like a forklift, uh, office trailer, the scale on the lower right and our beloved uh, uh, pickup truck and flatbed, you know, and it's been 11 years now, that truck only has 30,000 miles on it, but every mile it's carried a lot of tons. So the leaf springs are actually, it doesn't have that many miles, but the leaf springs are starting to go. But this is a very important initial funding. Also the lighting in the warehouse, and it just needed uh, basic uh, permitting and, and uh, improvements to get that going. So it's not a high, you don't have to, uh, that warehouse doesn't need a lot of, uh, you know, rebuilding or fitting out like a hospital or a school or something like that. Uh, a later solid waste uh, uh, reduction grant, uh, this is one we applied for uh, and, and received earlier this year, and that was to be able to move bulk material. And uh, such as brick rubble, we get a lot of calls from people who not only have intact brick, but also, uh, you know, rubble and other material that maybe is not so glamorous, but it does go in the landfill. And, you know, we do measure all of this by weight and send uh, uh, reports to the uh, uh, TCEQ. And so this is a lot of tonnage that's being diverted from landfills. Um, and so uh, where you see the unexpected at the bottom, uh, we found that we were able to afford a dump trailer. And so with this, we could go to nonprofit organizations uh, with projects to gather compost or other bulk, bulk material uh, and, uh, and uh, pick it up there, transport it, 
and uh, this saves them a lot of volunteers. And uh, uh, I do have to mention that this tump trailer, uh, you see the picture on the upper right, uh, there was a donation of asphalt. And so um, uh, the stump trailer picked up the asphalt and then at one of our other service centers, uh, there's a third pile you don't see there. Well, that was in the trailer. And unfortunately, even though it was parked behind several vehicles and locked up, uh, that trailer was stolen on Valentine's Day. And uh, so we're really sad about that. And we're with every police department and county agency around several states trying to locate that trailer and get it back. So I did have to mention that. So if you see a trailer with uh, big circular city decals missing and it's, uh, please let us know. And it, uh, it was full of asphalt there. But anyway, so then um, who brings in the material? Well, anyone from large corporations uh, on down to individual residents cleaning out their garages and backyards, small to medium companies uh, like uh, uh, junk removal companies, uh, other reuse facilities are key, and I'll, I'll point out something about that a little bit later that was unexpected, and also our own city. So we get a lot of material from our own public works department, and these are some of the uh, companies, uh, large and medium, that you see on the right-hand side, uh, mostly construction companies, including IKEA that has a, a big distribution center near here, and Exxon. Um, uh, all the way, uh, just different ones. Also, Habitat for Humanity uh, and Repurpose Depot in Historic Houston, other reuse facilities in, in the city there. And uh, so who takes this material? Uh, 501c3 nonprofit organizations who have to register, uh, schools, universities, government agencies. Right now, we've got about 800 separate groups uh, signed up with us. Uh, that picture there is the Magnolia Gardens Neighborhood Association in East Houston, and that is a uh, working uh, uh, food garden, and uh, they, that's been going for several years, and you can see the reused bricks for those raised beds. So a lot of gardens in the area. A lot of small religious organizations, uh, community development corporations, uh, and uh, organizations for the homeless, a lot of transitional housing. So a lot of this diverted material goes towards uh, basic home repair for people who need it, elderly, disabled, economically disabled, uh, but also the performing and visual arts. And we'll see a lots of, a little bit more of that uh, later. So a lot of stage sets with uh, diverted material on them. And then maker spaces, uh, women's organizations, veterans organizations, uh, uh, historic preservation, uh, animal shelters are key. And uh, one way to illustrate the way how this works is that a great value of the material that we give out, uh, let's say goes to an animal shelter, well then they're able to build more animal shelters with the material and get more dogs and cats off the street. So, um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of other uh, neighborhood organizations we did a small survey a few years ago, over about 90 days. It's hard to capture the value of the material we give away, but over that 90 days, uh, it came to be about a half a million dollars. So you can extrapolate that to be about $2 million a year of what we give away in, in building materials to nonprofits. Uh, we need a better survey than that, actually. And so, um, uh, so I'd like to, you know, it's hard to find that value. Uh, this, these are the kinds of materials we accept, uh, both new and used lumber, uh, and it doesn't have to be yellow. It can be on the gray side as long as it's reusable. Um, cabinets, bricks, uh, out, you know, landscape pavers. Uh, you know, a lot of the material you see is on the dingy side, but it's still reusable. We have people that reuse it well. So we like, you know, in, in a way, since we give it away for free, and people are innovative, we can take a deeper scoop out of the landfill and not just divert the beautiful new looking stuff. By the way, the pallet of bricks you see on the left uh, was donated by Habitat for Humanity. So a lot of work into that went into that brick. So it was removed from a house, cleaned, palletized. It didn't sell on their property. 
So then they brought it to us and we give it away for free. But that's one of the highest uh, dollar amounts of uh, materials that we deal with. And uh, uh, what we don't accept is rotten wood. We're not permitted to take paint or solvents or hazardous materials. Uh, we, we don't accept energy wasting appliances. We don't want to put them back out there. So, you know, low flow uh, plumbing facilities, uh, fixtures, and uh, uh, that, that's what we tend to give away. Or partial assemblies of material that you know, when it's just hard to take it apart and reuse, like half of a shed or something like that. Um, so this is the jump over to look at a few numbers or some tonnage and kind of the general picture in the United States in terms of construction material and diversion. And instead of using, we'll try to minimize the numbers used and use kind of visual uh, items here. So uh, here's the Great Pyramid of Giza, which weighs in at 65 million tons. And so, uh, uh, so we don't have to multiply 60 mi 65 million that much. But um, in the United States, uh, one of the most recent studies uh, showed that about nine of those great pyramids in the United States uh, of, of C&D waste of construction demolition material are generated each year. And that is more than twice as much as the municipal solid waste in the United States each year. And it's hard to say how much is diverted because some of the road reuse and recycling material uh, is confused and mixed up in those diversion uh, numbers. So we don't have a good uh, diversion number for that uh, material. Uh, and there you see that study from uh, 2004 and 5 that showed uh, about 40% of everything that is placed in land landfills, the whole waste stream is construction and demolition material. So uh, other, other, you know, uh, construction waste would take up another part of that. I'm sorry, commercial waste. So uh, just looking at Texas, uh, there are a few more numbers here. Uh, and some of the ways this material is counted varies from state to state. But uh, this was a 2018 uh, study. And so the state of Texas play, you know, generates about one great pyramid every 7.5 years. And then how much of that is diverted? About 6% in a tracked diversion rate. And if you take every person, all 29 million people in Texas, that's about 34, 34 pounds of construction material diverted per person. Um, and then in the city of Houston, using those numbers, uh, uh, about 15,000 tons are diverted. And the city of Houston generates uh, about one great pyramid of CND waste every 25 years. And then to look at another state where uh, Things are a little bit different. Uh, the Washington state back in 2013, uh, which by the way only has about 7 million people, generated about 6.6 .6 million tons of waste, uh, about one great pyramid every 10 years. So what's happening is that more material is being counted in Washington than is in Texas. And that, uh, that there is a significantly greater diversion rate that is tracked in the state of Washington uh, and so per person, uh, 877 pounds of CD material, uh, CND waste, is diverted per person in Washington uh, compared to about 35 pounds in Texas. I do want to backtrack and say that in Texas, uh, there's a lot of material that's diverted that's not counted. You know, we have about 40, 45 Habitat for Humanity restores. I'm not sure what is being accounted for. They're diverting the, the lion's share of material, of building material in Texas. And if we counted that, I think we would get a lot better numbers. They're really doing a, a, a lot there. So, okay, so down back down to the warehouse. Uh, this is like a typical, uh, typical arrangement of a, a variety of material that we uh, divert each month. And uh, we, this is our average of, you know, between 40 and 50 tons a month. The big players, of course, are masonry, wood, concrete, ceramic, and others. So some, one, one month it may be plastic, and another month it may be bricks, and another month it may be wood. And, uh, 
and just one uh, thing about this is wood is is takes the most processing of any of these materials you know the stacking the sorting you have to keep it out of the rain and um, take things apart and pack them that sort of thing so uh, okay this is kind of our EKG and this is over over two years and a kind of a key period uh, has a lot to do with today actually but you'll see the lighter lines there you know, we really get smacked with material sometimes. Uh, you know, it's kind of volatile. We'll have, you know, after the Super Bowl, our big player was plastic. You know, we had a lot of material, you know, about 165 tons of material that month. And uh, you'll see the, the, the red line actually follows the blue line. That means that the nonprofits, whenever we have a spike in material, they react by taking it away. So it's very efficient. We, we have about a 99% donation to collection ratio. Uh, so material doesn't sit around in the warehouse very often, and uh, we actually have room for more. So the, the, the darker line in the middle is, is uh, on average over two, uh, 24 months uh, mean, means average. And so that's, you know, around, it varies between 40 and 50. And once again, 40 and 50 tons a month, and once again, the nonprofits collect it just as soon as it comes in. And so, uh, so then uh, this is our over since we started, we've diverted 5,400 tons. Uh, you won't see pyramids here, so we're a little bit smaller. And uh, but this is uh, this year, uh, if you use the Eiffel Tower as a way to gauge the weight, well, then this is where we are. So in a few couple of years, we hope to have diverted the entire weight of, let's say, the, the Eiffel Tower out of landfills. So we are small, but uh, the, the intention from the beginning was not to, uh, you know, take care of everybody's construction material, but really see cultural and technological changes and get people excited about diverting construction materials. We've had a lot of companies come to us and say, we want to do this, and then it just takes time to gear up and be able to to do it. And uh, so uh, here are some of the advantages that we have. And like I said before, demand always rises to meet supply. Uh, that picture on the upper left was a, a load of drywall that uh, got rained on and is on, the, you know, going from Florida to California. Well, uh, they were in Texas, he was in San Antonio and, and they called us and they said, yeah, turn around, bring it to us, we'll take care of it. And, uh, there was a feeding frenzy for this material, and uh, it went to a lot of good use. Um, and lots of, you know, it's one of the rare materials that we get. There's a high need for that. Uh, we don't have to put price tags on the material in the warehouse, and uh, uh, you know, less security is, is less security is required. We don't have money on site, and and that really is an advantage. It's something we don't have to do that a lot of other reuse facilities have to do. Um, on the demand side, the giving side, little or no outreach is necessary. Word of mouth travels among nonprofits, and uh, uh, we we keep processing processing at a minimum. And a lot of the nonprofits kind of act as volunteers to help with that. So we don't have many volunteers per se, but a lot of the nonprofits provide that service. And uh, and just as before. You know, we can give away this old gray fencing because it doesn't need a price tag. We don't have to sell it. Um, our staff, we have usually about three people at the warehouse, and that's all we need as far as paid employees. Uh, that's me on the right in the picture, and Avery and Joyce Powell. Um, uh, in our operating costs, we keep low. Uh, we save money by diverting, you know, saving tipping fees from the landfill and also recycling some metal and cardboard but the lion's share of what we provide is that value of material that we give to nonprofits who then again take it and place that into the community. And uh, it's harder to measure, but it is a larger amount. Uh, one of the other unexpected things is uh, our friends in, in, at the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Northwest Harris County is our, our leading donor. So uh, we provide, uh, we try to provide clearance for these other uh, nonprofits that are doing reuse uh, facilities uh, so that they can you know shuttle that extra material that doesn't sell to us they can make room for other material that does sell 
So you know, we, we want to be partners and act in unison in our region for these other reuse facilities. Uh, some of our challenges are, and they're not really insurmountable or anything, uh, are that uh, more activity is involved, more management and administration uh, is required for the demand side. Uh, you see more paperwork on the right there in the picture. And uh, uh, we have a less, less time to go out and do outreach for supply. Um, but that still uh, is not uh, insurmountable. It's just one of the characteristics of running a facility like this. And then you can see our annual donations over time. And uh, it's sort of leveled off in the past few years. Uh, and then we're looking for ways to increase that. And uh, one of the ways that we have been able to do that is by uh, dealing with bulk material uh, using the tractor. Uh, for example, and really makes a difference and, and expands our our, rec or our, our um, recipe of materials that we can deal with. And uh, so then, you know, we're able to uh, double what we take in without uh, filling up the building. So we're always looking to increase supply. Um, other things that can really complement something like this in a city are um, uh, programs such as the phase. Uh, uh, disposal bans of certain kinds of materials. Uh, although many of them are construction materials, uh, there are only a few of them that perhaps we could deal with, such as uh, bricks, uh, glass, uh, gypsum, uh, and other materials. But uh, that's a really serious uh, planning effort going on there and uh, to uh, phase out materials. And also uh, our friends in the, in the city of Austin uh, have a uh, a uh, landfill diversion ordinance so that when uh, construction companies apply for a permit, uh, let's say per uh, square feet of area that they're building, they, there's a certain amount in, in pounds that uh, they need to divert from the construction site and uh, or, uh, or at least, you know, a certain percentage of construction debris. And so that actually uh, where we talk with, with the city of Austin a lot through the STAR Re Reuse Council, and uh, their program would complement ours, and our program would complement theirs. Uh, so that would be a good thing to add. So uh, we're kind of winding down here, but these are some examples of over time uh, to show how we work. Uh, the upper left uh, image there is a library in the Houston area. This was a lead program. Uh, and so, the, you know, you can see the bricks there being taken down and cleaned and saved, and also the library shelving on the inside. Uh, we were able to capture that shelving, and then uh, one of the area, the churches in the area, used that to make uh, transitional housing uh, out of the old library stacks, the old shelves there. So that that just kind of shows, you know, from the source and to the end use how that material can be diverted and reused and help uh, keep people uh, from uh, sleeping rough. And uh, so this is another example. Uh, we, we try to get involved with as many deconstruction projects around uh, this area, Home Builder. Uh, we have a lot of houses, smaller houses being demolished in the area. And uh, we were able to help bring in uh, Youth Build, which is a, a youth training organization in construction, and have them learn about deconstruction while also saving material from this house that was slated for demolition. And so, you know, we can really combine some of these, uh, we get involved with the missions of the nonprofits and put them in contact with the, with the material donors. And it's a real success. There are many different, more, more time than I have here to explain. And so here's one of the bigger spikes in the area. You know, after the Super Bowl in 2017, uh, we were able to get together with the Houston uh, School District and other nonprofits in the area, and this combined effort diverted 160 tons of material, mostly carpet and wall covering and, and banners and that sort of thing. And uh, the director of the sustainability program with the NFL, uh, Jack Rowe, he's been there for about 25 years. Uh, he said the Houston effort was the best and most complicated in the time he had ever done it. So we're really proud of that. Maybe not for the complication, but for the amount of diverted material. 
this is a surprise in that uh, in, in many cities that have fine arts programs, uh, works of art are shipped around the world in these fine crates. And uh, usually a work of art will only travel once and come back home. And then these crates are trashed. They're just broken up and placed in dumpsters. And uh, we've had a zero to 100% diversion rate. All of the museums in the area and all of the manufacturers of these crates bring them to us and we really, we give them all away. They're great material to divert. We're really proud of this. A lot of interesting things that happen from these crates. Uh, this is a, a water facility in North Harris County that was turned into a garden using uh, some of these crates. And there are just so many things that then happen with them. And so uh, this is just one example. So um, uh, I guess important for today and uh, is uh, the issue of, of natural storms, hurricanes, or any really any kind of disaster. Uh, it's been a surprise since Harvey in 2017 how we're, we were able to convert into a distribution center to nonprofits uh, providing disaster relief uh, to people who are rebuilding. So even if someone is not in a nonprofit, if they were flooded during Harvey, Imelda, and most certainly um, uh, Laura uh, coming up, they'll be able to get free building material through these organizations at the reuse warehouse. And we also uh, turned into a distribution point for new material uh, during that time uh, to be able to get that new drywall and insulation and flooring to people. So, uh, so uh, we're also uh, uh, involved in the Texas Reuse Contest, trying to uh, return the National Reuse Contest into into shape. And so uh, the uh, that's going on right now. So anyone who makes anything out of reuse material. Uh, can submit a couple of photographs. Uh, this is a run through our participation with the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling, the Reuse Council. And these are some of our prize winners last year. Somebody built a tree house. And, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, there was uh, some mosaic tile that Izzy was working on at this, the uh, Smither Park in Houston there. Beautiful park made out of reused tile. And so, uh, you know, I'll be able to, I'll be glad to uh, give you more information about that. Uh, this was this uh, project by Nestor Topshi won first place in the National Reuse Contest. Uh, that's, you know, here in Houston also, but there are prize winners all over the state in Austin, San Antonio, Fort Worth, and also smaller towns. Uh, we're really trying to get this all over the state. But you see here this artist studio made from casement windows from the church, uh, reused uh, metal, and also the concrete chunks, that riprap that you see at the bottom. And that re represents a large amount of carbon taken out of the atmosphere by reusing rather than, uh, than uh, recycling, either recycling or manufacturing new. So uh, yeah, anyway, uh, here's a couple of elements uh, that we, we just have to show early on. Uh, uh, Yoli Lemberger uh, made this Trojan horse out of concrete formwork lumber um, uh, back in uh, 2011. And uh, the, all over the country, just tons of this are just being thrown away in, to make uh, large water tanks. So we're trying to get involved with that and divert more of that really useful wood. And then this stage set, stage set by the Bay Area Ballet back in 2013, maybe the material that uh, came into the warehouse is really unrecognizable here, but a lot of that came from us, and we're really proud of that. So we'd like to thank the Houston Galveston Area Council and everyone for uh, 11 plus years, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions and also give a tour. Just give me a call, and I love. We'll socially distance, and and I'll give you a tour. So. I'll leave that at that, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Hi, hey, Mr. Klotsky, thank you very much for your presentation, and I hope people will be able to take you up on that tour. That sounds like that would be a great thing for people to actually get to see that. And sure. we do have a couple of questions, but we are also out of time, so I think that if it would be okay with our speakers, if we could just email you those questions and then get some answers and then we can just send that out with the follow-up to all of the attendees who came today. 
I have um, a quick couple of announcements. The presentations from today's webinar will be available online and I'll send the link to everyone as well as the answers to the questions. And we'll also send a link to a survey because any feedback we get can help us just make better presentations and webinars for you in the future. I want to uh, let you know that our next webinar will be on November 19th and our topic is still under development. We'll let you know about that soon and we look forward to seeing everybody then. I want to especially thank our speakers, Colleen Halbrook, Jeff Payne, John Krager, and Keith Kosky for their presentations today. And I want to thank you all for joining us on a day when we might be having a hurricane later or when we're just, you know, it's just a Wednesday, I think. So again, thank you and have a great and safe rest of your day and rest of your week.